Thank you for being here today on this great feast day of Our Lady. So I already, uh, I was led in my prayer time to a particular message from uh, the Diary of St. Faustina, but I said a little prayer after Holy Communion, and I said, Lord, if you would like in a small way to tickle the hearts of your people, if you would give me a memory of a message of Our Lady that um, I could share with them first uh, in honoring her on this special day, and immediately one came. It was a beautiful one. I'll never forget it. It was a good lesson, a good uh, teaching in faith. It's a rather long message, so I'm only using a certain part of it, and I know it will touch your hearts. She begins with saying, my greatest desire is to take you to my son. Always, always Our Lady speaks first and points first to her son. Everything is about God. He waits for you with his arms open wide. He cannot refuse you because his heart is so pure and full of love. Jesus' heart is so pure and filled with love that he cannot refuse you because of that love. So that's, that's a blessed assurance that we all need to, you know, hang on to. But here's the message in the memory. She says, where my statue is displayed, let it be a place that is clean and well kept. I will never forget this. I will never forget the first time I read this, to, this message to, to, the, to the group that was here. <clears throat> there was a group that was on retreat too that day. And I, I remember seeing their eyes just, oh, oh, kind of right up there. The statue must be washed regularly and freshly painted when needed. I love flowers, pink in color, and red, red roses. Care for your statue with your own hands, and I will grant you three graces. Have it blessed, and I will petition my son for a rainbow to be placed over your home, recognizable from heaven. <clears throat> so, this faithful group that was here on retreat on that particular day, right? They were looking at each other, you know, kind of like, hmm. And so afterwards, um, when I went to talk to them, they said, well, you know, um, yes, a number of us have statues that could use some fresh paint and to be washed off of the spider webs, etc. So it did touch a lot of hearts. But they said, we have a, a particular statue of Our Lady at our parish, and it really is in sad, sad shape. Uh, definitely needs cleaning up and painting, so on and so forth. And so um, they said, so do you, Catherine, you know, honestly, Our Lady, red, red roses, and flowers pink in color, and three graces will be granted to me. And she said, could you only imagine? Could you only imagine? Don't you love that song? Could you only imagine if we did this at our parish, how many more would be so greatly blessed? And really, really, Catherine, do you think red roses? I said, that's what she says, you know? Um, and I take her at her word. I take her at her word. Because at my deathbed, she was there. And she always comes through. And throughout my life, our lady always came through and comes through for us. But here's the grace. So they did this. They went back to their parish, their pastor, and they asked for permission to have the statue cleaned and repainted, and they did all of that, and they asked him to bless it. As soon as they finished praying the rosary, and their pastor gave that statue its final blessing, a massive rainbow was held over that church. Yeah, never to be forgotten. I'll never forget that when they came back and told me that. The faith of the people, see? The faith of the people. And as Our Lady has taught us, through one of the other messages that she revealed, and this beautiful gold dust that she dispenses throughout the universe, you know, and taught that that gold dust, she was teaching on the priesthood in, in that message, and all these gold rocks, these priests, and, you know, solid, holy, good priests, pure priests, when they pray, 
many thousands upon thousands upon thousands of souls are saved all over the world. And when the people are praying in union with these priests, okay, so that's the holy sacrifice of the Mass, rosaries, chaplets, etc., that this gold dust, Our Lady displayed this beautiful gold dust, a gold that I never even could see. I mean, there's never been a gold more beautiful than that gold. I don't know how do you, how do you explain the most beautiful gold in the world. Just permeating the air, never touching the ground. And she said, that is the, a, a symbol of, she said, that is the prayerful, the prayer, prayers of the faithful. So the holiness, you know, the holiness of God and the prayers of the people. I was led to a, a teaching of St. Faustina in the diary, notebook five, entry 1565, and it's about the chaplet of divine mercy. And over the 25 or so years in ministry, the numerous um, faith stories of people about the chaplet of divine mercy um, really, really brought back quite a few memories and, and great hope, renewed hope. She states, when I entered the chapel for a moment, the Lord said to me, my daughter, help me to save a certain dying sinner. Say the chaplet that I have taught you for him. St. Faustina replies, when I began to say the chaplet, I saw the dying man in the midst of terrible torment and struggle. His guardian angel was defending him. But he was, as it were, powerless against the enormity of the soul's misery. A multitude of devils were, was waiting for the soul. But while I was saying the chaplet, I saw Jesus just as he depicted in, was depicted in the image. The rays which issued from Jesus' heart enveloped the sick man, and the powers of darkness fled in panic. So St. Faustina is, um, if I remember correctly, she, she was bilocating at this time. She wasn't in the actual presence of this man. So from her cell, her room, she was interceding as God had directed her to pray. So she was interceding to Almighty God, Father in Christ. So as she pleaded to the Father on behalf of this sinner, um, as Jesus requested her, with Christ, that combined priesthood, that royal priesthood, and you know we share in the priest, prophet, all of that together with him, this man was enveloped in those rays of God's mercy, of Jesus' mercy, that unleashing, if you will, that shedding of that great water and blood of his, that the righteousness given to souls because of God's holiness, Jesus' holiness, and the blood that Jesus shed, and that continues to cleanse and to heal. The rays which, which issued from Jesus' heart enveloped the sick man, and the powers of darkness fled in panic. The sick man peacefully breathed his last. When I came to myself, I understood how very important the chaplain was for the dying. It appeases the anger of God. It appeases the anger of God. And so how many, how many people, I remember even my mother, um, when her sister was on her deathbed in, in her last agony, if you will, and my mother just, it just came to her heart again to start praying the chaplain. And my mom said, because my aunt was unresponsive, but when she was praying that chaplet, I remember her saying, my aunt was saying to her, yes, 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 yes. This is the cry of the heart in that transforming state, in that transferring, if you will, from this life to the next life. It's critical that we remember to implore eternal father with Jesus Christ on behalf of the sin. And obviously, if this man had all these devils around him, okay, he was not leading a saintly life. But there might have been one ray of hope. There might have been one cry from his heart to Jesus. 
And so Jesus bent down to aching mankind, to humanity, and interceding on, on this man's behalf with a victim soul, if you will, with a, a, a soul that was willing to give herself in prayer, even as sick as she was with tuberculosis. Um, so there's no end to what a human being can do by the power of God, right? From there, I was led to another reading, uh, actually a prayer of divine mercy. And I remember, Midge, you um, were saying, you know, the many um, very special moments on the deathbed of your recently mother. deceased mother-in-law and how that affected her and the family, and so many, Mary Jane, and I know that uh, Chris Hathaway and her, her husband have their watches uh, signaled for the 3 o'clock hour, so they're praying for their intentions, and so many here. And so it's critical at the deathbed. It's critical in that transmission. And then even in the sick, especially when we're sick, we don't have to wait till someone's sick and dying to pray for them. But also in those moments of our own terror, in the moments where we can't see outside of the storm, when we find ourselves in a situation or in a, in a, in a level of sickness or something that you know, we're so heavily burdened with that we can't see the light, that we call on the body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we can do that because Jesus died for that purpose. That's why he died, so that we can call on him, okay, and then expect, to have that expected faith for results because Jesus wants this for us. Almighty God wants us to be with him forever into eternity. The prayer is, O everlasting love, Jesus, you have enclosed yourself in the host. Okay, so we all just received Holy Communion. Let us think with the mind and the heart of St. Faustina, the apostle of divine mercy. You have enclosed yourself in the host, and therein hide your divinity and conceal your beauty. You do this in order to give yourself whole and entire to my soul, and in order not to terrify it with your greatness. I'll stop there for one second. In order not to terrify it, our soul, her soul in this prayer, with its greatness. You know, today we have become so desensitized, even irreverent to the holiness of God, God's presence. This brings us right to the point that we have got to realize the holy of holies, the Lord of lords, the King of Kings. I learned this. I can tell you this firsthand. The human being has no power. Absolutely no power. Not one cell can move in God's presence without God's saying so. When Jesus appeared to me in 1994, I lost all power in my body. I had no control to even move a toe. Everything stops in God's presence. The world stops. There is no time for God. With God, I should say. There is no time. It's all about Him. You know, we walk through our days and we think, you know, I got to do this and I have to do this and that one has to do this because I need to have that done and I, you know, it's always about me. I need this, I have to have that, I've got to do that, and why aren't you listening to me, and why, you know, it's about me. And it's not about me. It's not about us at all. It's everything about God. Everything. Everything happens in God's timing. And so many of us make the sad mistake <coughs> of pressing at the wrong time, of acting at the wrong time, of giving up at the wrong time. If God says it, and you know God wants our holiness. He wants us to be honorable people. He wants us to be with him forever in eternity. Then with the purity of heart and intention, even if we're making a mistake and we don't realize it, but from the purity of our heart, we believe we're doing the right thing. 
God will make up for that lack. But we have got to trust God. And we have to give him the time in our life to move. We must wait on him. We must learn to grow in the virtue of patience. Patience with ourselves, patience with God, and patience with man and woman, you know, our neighbor. We need to give God our willingness to be patient. Pazienza, pazienza, patience. We must be patient. It's in that God can do so much because it's not just about us. Most often, God is working on all the others in our circle and outside that, and so on and so forth. You do this in order to give yourself whole and entire to my soul, and in order not to terrify it with your greatness. Almighty God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the most blessed Trinity, is terrifyingly, amazingly glorious. Glorious, terrifyingly, amazingly glorious. O oh, everlasting love, Jesus, you have shrouded yourself with bread, eternal light, incomprehensible fountain of joy and happiness, because you want to be in heaven, on earth to me, that indeed you are, when your love, O oh God, imparts itself to me, do you believe that that Holy Communion that you just received is God imparting himself to you? He does this so that in a very tangible way, you know, we say we love God, but we can't touch him, right? But we can't touch him in Holy Communion. He touches us. He invented this, if you will, so that we can have him. Because we all have this big God hole in us. If we realize it or we don't, the sooner we realize it, the better off we are. But that God hole can only be filled with the personhood of Jesus Christ, the most blessed Trinity. O oh, greatly merciful God, infinite goodness, Today all mankind cries out from the abyss of its misery, misery to your mercy, to your compassion, O oh God. And it is with this mighty voice of misery that it cries out, Gracious God, do not reject the prayer of this earth's exiles. O oh Lord, goodness beyond our understanding, who are acquainted with our misery through and through, in that by your own power, by our own, I'm sorry, who that acquainted with our misery through and through, and know that by our own power we cannot ascend to you, we implore you, anticipate us with your grace and keep on increasing your mercy in us, that we may faithfully do your will, your holy will, all through our life and at our death's hour. Let the omnipotence of your mercy shield us from the darts of our salvation's enemies, that we may with confidence as your children await your final coming, <coughs> that day known to you alone. So when somebody tells you on September 13th or something, Jesus is coming and he's going to whip us all up into heaven, don't believe them. And we expect to obtain everything. I love that. You have to say that. I expect, I expect to obtain everything because Jesus died for me. Everything promised by, to us by Jesus in spite of all of our wretchedness. For Jesus is our hope. And if in your hard time you can't remember any special prayer, remember that one. Jesus, you are my hope. Jesus, you are my hope through his merciful heart as through an open gate we pass through to heaven. 
Through his heart, as though an, through an open gate, we pass through to heaven. I can remember this man. It was the very first, wit very first miracle I ever witnessed in my lifetime. And it radically set up today. All of these things, one thing built on the next, built on the next, and that's mercy. That's how Jesus works in his mercy. He builds up our confidence so that we can take those deeper, you know, we can go out deeper because we look back on the last thing and we say, well, we got through that. And we did good, Jesus. Okay, I'll, I'll try this. I'll, I'll, I'll go out a little bit deeper this time. And that's how we build on that confidence of his mercy. The very first miracle I ever witnessed, besides my own, was this man named Paul who lived locally. He's passed on now uh, from old age. Um, he became very sick. He had complete kidney failure, needed to have transplant. He was on the machine. Um, had developed a horrific bed sore, which was about that big, massive. And while he was in the house, in his, or rather, a hospital for his six month stay, his wife passed away, but he was too ill to go to her funeral. He could not even lift a finger, he could not be moved. Um, he could not keep down a teaspoon, not a teaspoon of water, without vomiting. And so they had him on feeding tubes and all kinds of stuff. And I remember it was close to his very end when um, they called me and another servant to um, just go and pray with him. And I remember in my heart, and I, I feel this way every single time, I have nothing. What do I have? I'm just an average person like everybody else. Um, so I remember going into our how well, it was a closet, a, a locked closet to get the relic of St. Faustina. It was after Holy Mass, so I had Jesus and I had St. Faustina, and I thought, okay, we're as equipped as we're ever going to be in our whole life right now. And we went to the hospital to pray with this man, Paul. <coughs> and he was a devout Catholic. And I remember the first thing that that man asked me, and it impressed me. His first question was, are you Catholic? Is this Catholic? And I said, yes, yes, it's very Catholic. About as Catholic as you can get. Communion, relic, yep, we're good. Very <laughs> Catholic. And, um, and so I said, we'll just pray for you. We prayed the chaplet of divine mercy. And I made the sign of the cross. And me and my companion left. That was it, the chaplet. That we just prayed, we blessed him with the relic, and left. And so the next morning when he woke up, he asked the nurses to take all these tubes out because he was healed. His wound was radically closing up, but he was also, and this was the funny thing, he was craving McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> this man who couldn't keep a teaspoon of water teaspoon of water down was craving McDonald's. So the nurses, his head nurse, called the son and said, you must come immediately to the hospital. Your father's in his last moments. We recognize this, that you know, quite often they want to do things and eat things and stuff that's not even, you know, it's not possible. And so um, he got on the phone with his father to talk to him in case, you know, he, he wouldn't make it in time to the hospital. And his father, a very, um, strong and powerful man <laughs> demanded that his son bring him this bag of McDonald's. I don't remember all the stuff that was in there, but it was a, it was a bag and he just went down this what he wanted. And so the son knew for sure my father's down. You know, he's, he's hallucinating or something. And so when he brought it into his father, he demanded that the nurses take these feeding tubes and stuff out of him. The wound was considerably small at this time. So, it, I mean, by the hours, it was closing. So, um, he ate that bottle, of, I mean, that whole bag of McDonald's. <laughs> he ate the whole, who can, even healthy people, 
Who can eat a whole bag of McDonald's and not, hmm, right? Nobody, I can't. He ate that bag of McDonald's and he sent his son out for more. <laughs> yeah, polished that off and uh, proceeded to get up and walk. And by the following day, that, that whole big wound that was massive, it was like a plate, was completely healed. He died some few years after that, just from old age and whatnot. But that was the first miracle I ever experienced after my own. And so I share that with you, that your hope may be increased. Your trust in Jesus may be increased. Because I'm just like you. I have nothing. But I had just received Holy Communion, the bread of life, the bread of angels. God present to me, right? And the Saint Faustina. So it's like I had God and I had this massive, powerful saint and guardian angels. Even when my knees were shaking because I didn't know what was going to happen, you know? Um, but God loves to use the little people, you know, to do great things. And in those moments of terror, when you can't see, where your heart cries out for whatever reason, for your own sickness, or when is this going to end? Maybe, maybe you're called to be an apostle like St. Faustina, that all of your suffering is being offered up. But anyway, you probably know all that. Just ask God for the grace to grow in patience so that we can be patient with God. We can be patient with ourselves. We have to be nice to ourselves too. You know, so many people when we fall down and we make a mistake or we, you know, we slip up, we get so angry with ourselves that we quit. We can't quit. There's no quitting with God. So we ask him for that grace in those moments. We ask him for forgiveness. We ask him for grace. We dust ourselves up. We go to confession. We get back out there. There's too many souls are waiting for you, for your prayers, for your intercession, and for that connection of unleashing Really, the Gospels, the living Gospel, the living Word to our neighbors. May God bless us. May God bless our families. God bless this ministry of divine mercy and every effort of divine mercy throughout the world. God bless America.